the true origin of Yahweh from Anunnaki to the God of the Bible. In the vast collection of gods and supernatural beings in human beliefs, the name Yahweh, the God of the Bible, stands out and has been remembered for many centuries. Why is this name so influential and deep? Could Yahweh have ties to the Anunnaki that we don't know about today? Who is he really? Is he the all-powerful God that is worshipped by religions that come from Abraham? And if not, who or what could Yahweh really be? We'll find the answers in the new episode of the Lore Library. Welcome. The holy books of Abraham's followers tell us about a God who seems to run a grand show in the cosmos. This God creates the universe, stars, animals, plants, people, and everything we know. This all-powerful maker often goes by the name Yahweh in these texts. This name isn't just a tag, it's like a door that lets us see how people's ideas of God have changed over time. It represents our never-ending quest to understand the universe and our place in it. The name Yahweh has had a big effect on our shared history, shaping societies, influencing customs, and guiding the story of humanity. Looking closely at Yahweh is more than just studying. It's like going on a trip into the heart of our culture trying to understand our shared past. But what does this mean for our understanding of divinity? What mysteries might we uncover about our origins? This trip takes us back to where civilization first started in the ancient Near East. Could this be where the name Yahweh first emerged? Here we start to dig into a fascinating and complex story. Interestingly, this trip to the Near East brings us face to face with the Anunnaki, who were the gods in ancient Mesopotamian myths. And as you might know, not only did these gods play a big role in stories about the world's creation, and were worshipped by the Sumerians, Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians, but could there be a link between these ancient gods and Yahweh? Is it possible that Yahweh grew out of or even came from these Anunnaki? Finding these answers lets us uncover a hidden layer of ancient stories, changing how we understand the beginning of humans. There's an even older story hidden in the Genesis text that has been kept out of public view for hundreds of years because of translation mistakes and the rules of the church. But what is this ancient tale trying to tell us? By the end of this journey, we hope to answer the big question. Who is Yahweh, the God in the Bible? And what implications does this have for our understanding of religion and spirituality? Our oldest reference to Yahweh is found on the Moabite stone, or the Mesha steel, erected by King Mesha of Moab around 840 BCE, celebrating his victory over Israel. The stele recounts a story similar to that found in 2 Kings 3, with one crucial difference. The stele proclaims a Moab victory, while the Bible claims victory for Israel. Interestingly, the reference to Yahweh reinforced the belief that he was exclusively an Israelite deity, as Mesha brags about seizing objects associated with Yahweh and presenting them to his own god, Chemosh. Fast forward to 1844, when archaeologist Carl Richard Lepsius excavated the ruins of the ancient city of Soleb in Nubia. Extensive excavations wouldn't take place until 1957, led by the archaeologist Mikhail Shifkiranini. They found a reference to a group known as the Shasu of Yahweh, inscribed at the base of one of the temple's columns. The reference to Yahweh connected to the Shasu suggested that this god had been worshipped by another group long before the biblical narratives are thought to have occurred. The Egyptians described the Shasu as Semitic nomads, often viewed as outlaws. While attempts were made to connect them with the Hebrews, these claims were rebutted. The reference to the Shasu of Yahweh not only pushes the origins of this deity further back than previously thought, but also states that Yahweh might not have been Canaanite in origin. But if not, then what's the origin of the first Yahweh? One theory suggests that Yahweh was a desert god adopted by the Hebrews during their exodus from Egypt to Canaan. Fire-related imagery in the book of Exodus, along with Yahweh's ability to guide Moses to water sources, underpins this idea. However, many believe that Yahweh originated as a minor god within the Canaanite pantheon, and was adopted by the nomadic Shasu during their time in the region. The word Yahweh itself is an ancient linguistic artifact rooted deeply in Semitic languages and carrying echoes of the civilizations that created it. Intriguingly, it seems to be linked to the verb to be, giving it a sense of existence. Other interpretations of its meaning include he who makes that which has been made and he brings into existence whatever exists. The word Yahweh evolved into Jehovah in the late Middle Ages the name Yahweh could also be derived from the Arabic language, potentially indicating a passion or commitment of the deity toward his people, aligning with biblical references to Yahweh as a jealous God. Yahweh's transformation from a local deity of the Midianites into a sole deity of the Israelites is mirrored in the evolution of his name, starting as a reflection of a local deity's commitment to his tribe and evolving into a declaration of existence and commitment of the one true God to his chosen people. In Judaism, the name of God was considered too sacred to be spoken, so the consonants Y to W were used as a reminder to say Adonai, Lord, instead. 
The origins of Yahweh remain obscure, with biblical passages differing in their interpretations. After the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BCE, Yahweh's power was codified in the Hebrew scriptures which were canonized during the Second Temple period, including the concept of a Messiah as the all-powerful creator, preserver, and redeemer of the universe. This concept was later adopted by early Christians, who believed that God sent Jesus as the promised Messiah. In Islam, this deity was interpreted as Allah. Now back in time during the Iron Age, the Israelites in Canaan sought to distinguish themselves from their neighbors by elevating Yahweh above El, the traditional Canaanite supreme god. However, they didn't fully embrace monotheism yet. The people remained henotheistic through the era of Judges and the Kingdom of Israel. The kingdom split following Solomon's death in 931 BCE, leading to the creation of the southern kingdom of Judah with Jerusalem as its capital. In Judah, worshiping Yahweh was not just a religious act, it was also part of their identity. Yahweh was seen as their protector, and the people of Judah believed they were chosen by Yahweh, which influenced everything from their religious traditions to their political decisions and cultural ways of life. Kings of Judah were seen as the earthly representatives of Yahweh, chosen by him to lead his people, giving them both political and religious power. They were the protectors of faith, charged with keeping its practices pure and upholding its principles. However, the relationship between Yahweh and the kings of Judah wasn't always smooth. There were times when kings motivated by political gain or personal ambition strayed from the faith. They brought in foreign gods, allowed blended practices in Yahweh's worship, and persecuted the prophets who dared to criticize them. These actions were seen as betrayals of Yahweh, deserving divine punishment. During these periods of religious change, prophets emerged as the moral compass of Judah. They were seen as the voice of Yahweh, guiding the people back to their God. They spoke out against idol worship condemned injustices in society and warned about the severe consequences of abandoning Yahweh. Their messages were not always well received, but they were crucial, leading the people of Judah back to Yahweh whenever they strayed. But the question remains, why do we as a collective society continuously revere this deity born from the pages of history as the one true God? What compels us to give thanks, beseech blessings and crown praises to this entity? Might our fascination with the divine reflect a deeper urge to explore our own complexities and unravel the mysteries of divine identities concealed within sacred texts? Could it be that our minds are drawing us into an intriguing maze of cosmic knowledge and self-discovery? It's as though we are cracking open an ancient vault, decoding whispers of divine echoes that have resonated through time and space. Could this adventure not only reveal the secrets of the Anunnaki and ancient aliens, but also illuminate our understanding of ourselves and our place in the cosmos? Acknowledging that Yahweh was not initially a single deity, but evolved into a monotheistic god is crucial to perceiving the extraterrestrial influence on our civilization's growth. Now, it's important to understand that Yahweh's evolution from being one among many to being the supreme deity worldwide happened along two pathways. Firstly, from a human viewpoint, we've been exploring how the shift from polytheism to monotheism in ancient Israel was a slow and complex process spanning several centuries. In the late Bronze Age, numerous deities were linked with powerful cities in a typically polytheistic society. Israel had its national deity but still acknowledged a pantheon, much like other ancient Near Eastern states. Over time, Yahweh started assuming a dominant role, slowly transitioning toward monotheism, a path marked by social, political, and cultural alterations over time. Secondly, the theological transition of Yahweh to the sole deity represents the perspective of the divine entities themselves. The ancient aliens theory positions these beings as physical entities that visited our ancient past, bringing into question whether Yahweh was a specific entity or a name for a group of individuals. The connection between Yahweh and our channel's primary focus, the Anunnaki, is evident. Since regions where names of Yahweh, El, Asherah, and other gods emerged are the same regions where the Anunnaki appeared and were revered. Delving further into this analysis, we find striking similarities between some of the renowned Anunnaki entities and the characteristics of Yahweh. Jacques' journey from a divine warrior to a supreme deity over all others, a creator, a blessing, a salvation provider, a father god, is interesting. Observing Anunnaki gods Enki, Lil, and Ninorta shows intriguing parallels with Yahweh's characteristics, hinting at possible overlaps and transformations. Examining the Mesopotamian god Enki, the god of knowledge, sciences, and hidden metals, shares a closer alignment with Yahweh's qualities. His wisdom, understanding, and control over gold and silver parallel Yahweh's attributes in the Bible. Another Anunnaki, Ninorta, the god of agriculture, hunting, and war, shares his protective nature and warrior qualities with Yahweh. 
However, suggesting that Yahweh is merely Anki or Ninorta or any other deity cloaked in biblical Hebrew disguise is overamplification. It is necessary to study the nuanced relationship and the roles of these deities in the Sumerian and biblical accounts to truly understand their connection and evolution. Consequently, the study of Yahweh's transition from being a deity among many to becoming a singularly revered God involves understanding both the human-driven sociocultural, political shifts and theological changes from the God's perspective. It's a complex and intriguing study that broadens our understanding of the Anunnaki and ancient alien theory, providing new perspectives on the development of our civilization. However, it's important to note that Ninorta was not regarded as a deity in hiding by the earlier Sumerians, and depictions of him were not uncommon. Yet, as we delve further into the Yahweh-Ninorta connection, we find a substantial ancient text that shines a light on a significant event, challenging the idea that Ninorta and Yahweh are one and the same. The specific text concerns a remarkable and unforgettable occurrence, the specific details of which suggest that Ninorta could not have been Yahweh. One of the most pivotal acts attributed to Yahweh in the Bible, with lasting consequences and enduring memories, is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The event is also chronicled in Mesopotamian texts, allowing for a comparison of the deities involved. In Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah, cities located in the lush plain south of the Salt Sea, are depicted as sinful. Yahweh descends from his dwelling and, accompanied by two angels, visits Abram and his wife Sarai near Hebron. After foretelling that the elderly couple will have a son, Yahweh sends the two angels to Sodom to evaluate the city's sinfulness. Yahweh then informs Abram that if their sins are confirmed, the cities and their inhabitants will be destroyed. Abram implores Yahweh to spare Sodom if at least 50 righteous people are found within its walls. Yahweh agrees to desist after Abram successfully negotiates the number down to 10 and departs. The angels, having witnessed the city's wickedness, urge Lot to take his family and escape. Lot asks permission to seek refuge in the mountains and the angels consent, foreshadowing the impending destruction. Eventually, the doomed fate of the cities is triggered as Yahweh reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, unleashing furious fire from the skies. He upheaved those cities and the entire plain, along with all its inhabitants and everything that grew on the ground. Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before Yahweh, and looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward the land of the plain, and he saw smoke rising from the earth like the smoke of a furnace. In Mesopotamian records, this very event is stridently documented as the climax of Marduk's battle to establish dominance on earth. The Mesopotamian texts explicitly attribute the upheaval of the sinful cities to Nergal, not Ninorda. Given that the Bible asserts that it was Yahweh himself who unleashed the destruction on the cities, rather than the two investigating angels, it becomes apparent that Yahweh cannot be equated with Ninorta. In his book, The Divine Encounters, Zechariah Sitchin grapples with the enigma shrouding the identity of Yahweh and draws a remarkable conclusion. The idea from the Bible that the Elohim, the gods or the Anunnaki, had a god of their own might seem utterly absurd initially, but upon deeper reflection it seems to make a lot of sense. This leads us to pose a critical question. If the Nephilim were the gods who created men on Earth, was it just evolution on the twelfth planet that gave rise to the Nephilim? These technologically advanced beings capable of space travel hundreds of thousands of years before us, and deriving cosmological explanations for the solar system's creation, they must have also questioned their origins. This could have led them to what we define as religion, their concept of God where, according to Sitchin, Yahweh isn't an Anunnaki but rather a divine being that even the Anunnaki revered. Now, returning to our initial questions, we've probed the contrasting viewpoints about Yahweh's identity, the human historical perspective, and the God's own viewpoint. This intricate tapestry of perspectives underscores the topic's complexity, as well as its interconnectedness. The imposing nature of the Anunnaki topic and the potential of the ancient alien theory to rock the world's religious perceptions becomes clear. Mainstream religions often fail to inspire a deep, intimate connection with the divinity that permeates and is in all things. They tend to project God as a distant, judgmental entity who, despite his proclaimed love for us, keeps tabs on our actions. But in our view, our true spiritual quest leads us inward. It invites us to explore the divine within us, to truly connect with our essence and an authentic religion is our own inner self, linked with everything. As for Yahweh, well, Yahweh, along with the other gods, deserves due respect for their roles in history. They've shaped our civilization, culture, bodies, and life itself. And that's all there is. We bow before you and thank you for watching another episode. Keep your minds open, and until we meet again.